Hello, and welcome to this panel talk. Um, we're tackling a new subject in this industry as um, man-made cellulosic fibers uh, have long claimed to be more sustainable than cotton. And now this family of fibers believes it can be a viable replacement for performance synthetics by providing a biodegradable, non-fossil fuel-based alternative for active wear. So the question is, is it time for brands to rethink their fiber priorities or not? Um, I have here a panel of people who will walk us through this new landscape for the active wear industry. Um, so before we dig in, I'll ask each speaker to introduce themselves briefly and the company they work for. Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Ashwin Jaju and I work with Optimer. It's a US-based uh, textile research and development based uh, bra ingredient brand marketing company. Uh, I am a textile engineer by trade, but I oversee primarily the product development, the technical R&D, and also oversee uh, supply chain, sales, and marketing for Optimer. Thank you. Andreas? Hello, everyone. My name is Andreas Gürtler. I'm from Austria, representing Lansing Fibers, and I'm with Lansing since 2003. And started there as a marketing manager for Wovens, and uh, soon later implementing the tensile lyosol fiber for function wear. Um, looking very much forward to your questions, and I uh, will hand over to uh, Carmen. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Carmen Danner. I speak for HiQ and HiQ Aeonic today. We are based in Switzerland and Austria. I am the director of business development, working for HiQ since two years. Before that, I served the industry in the last 25 years in different roles. Um, yes, my background is more coming from economy, marketing, and sales. Okay, thank you. So, um, let's start. Let's start with you, Carmen. Uh, you're the newest player on the block. And uh, what inspired HiQ, which is a chemicals company, to diversify into fibers? That's a good question, Sophie. Thanks for that. So, actually, we started 18 years ago. Our birthday is coming soon. And HiQ has started in 2005 as a finishing company for textiles on the performance side. And we are on the stock market since 2020 and are diversified since 2020 as we bought more companies. So now we are in different segments and the overall hierarchy of this is called innovation. And one of our game changing platforms or profit centers now will become HiQ Aeonic and that's why we are here today. When do you expect it to come to market? We expect it to be on the market in 2025, end of 2025, 2026 latest. We are already on the market, but with a limited capacity and uh, with nominated brand partners. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andreas, let's move on to you. Uh, what is the motivation behind Lensing's move into outdoor and active apparel, which is fairly recent, I think? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, it's interesting because um, when we started uh, to produce the tensile lyosol fiber, it has been initially being uh, positioned as a fiber for the fashion industry. But because of some conversations uh, with our R&D department, we found out that the tensile lyosol fiber has so many properties which are suitable for the active sportswear market. Like for example, the fiber has a very smooth uh, surface. It has a cooling property. Moisture will be distributed within the fiber. Um, it's hygiene, so it does not uh, allow bacteria to grow without any uh, silver ions, for example. And uh, the circular cross section, you will see it la later in the, with the presentation, the circular cross-section also gives a very good stability of the fiber because um, that also, uh, this also leads to a better wrinkle recovery when it comes to outdoor apparel. Okay, thank you. Um, Ashwin, please, you are our 
synthetics representative here. So can you present the case for synthetics in active wear and why have they come to dominate? And then walk us through what makes dry release a sp special concept. Thank you, Sophie. So synthetic, as you know, if you walk around, uh, majority of the products here are synthetic based. And especially in the active wear, the primary property of synthetic is being hydrophobic. Water heating helps in faster drying or not holding that water to provide that discomfort. So having that primary property is one of the reasons synthetic has excelled in the activewear sportswear arena. That's not just one property, but there are others too. Uh, others being um, being able to mass produce at a much economical rate is another advantage with synthetic, both polyester and nylon. Uh, other ad advantage with synthetic is the durability. It is much more durable. So from a life standpoint, it can go through multiple washings without impacting the performance, aesthetics, and uh, the way the garment would perform. Uh, apart from this, also, the advancement in technologies have uh, changed the way people look at synthetics. Uh, there has been recent trend in athleisure, so more softer, more natural hand feel. That's where uh, cellulose components and regenerated cellulose comes into play. But synthetics, which were always uh, labeled as more shiny, non-natural, but with changes in technologies, finishes, they're able to catch up on those advantages that uh, cellulose have and uh, provide more fibers or uh, more technologies that are fit mo uh, towards uh, that at leisure trend. Okay, thank you. Now tell us about dry release, because it's a special blend of synthetic and non-synthetics. Well, how do you construct your, your material? Do you want me to show it, maybe? Yes, sure. Here we go. So dry release is an optimized blend of hydrophobic, which primarily comes from synthetic fibers. There are natural, some natural fibers that are hydrophobic, like kapok. But in this case, we're talking primarily about synthetics combined with small amount of natural fibers to provide the performance of wicking and fast drying. We then further dug into why cellulose, or primarily cotton, is always correlated with comfort. One of the primary reasons with cotton is being it's a natural fibers, it comes in variety of shapes and sizes. It's natural, it has its natural variation. So we tried to mimic that natural variation with polyester and have a polyester yarn with a multi-denier and multi-staple length fibers within the yarn. So that provides an added level of comfort in the yarn when it's knitted or when it's woven. That primarily 85 to 90% polyester or nylon, multi-denier, multi-staple length fibers, combined with that 10 to 15% natural or man-made cellulosic fibers, provide the optimum and engineered blend to give a balance of wicking and fast drying. The natural fibers here provides a way to channel the water through the yarn structure, and the hydrophobic water heating fibers helps to drive that moisture out. So there's push-pull reaction naturally without the use of any chemicals. And because the performance is engineered in the yarn blend, it gives a permanent performance without the need of chemical finishes or additional wicking treatments. 
Okay, thank you. Let's, let's stick to the wicking and the comfort. I think the cellulosics have something going for them with regards to comfort, certainly. But in active wear, where I feel that cellulosics are a bit difficult to defend, is in moisture management. So I'd like each of our speakers to tell us, I guess you've covered that, Jejun, uh, Ashwin. But Carmen and Andreas, can you walk us through the wicking and moisture management properties of your fibers? Should I show your, Andreas, maybe? Because yes, please. you have the fiber um, and the. Maybe you can click through um, this. Um, this, yeah, exactly. there we go. Um, what you can see here is the cross section of our tensile lyosyl fiber. And uh, with this picture, I can explain you the, the properties of the fiber. On the very right hand side, you see here the porous structure of the lyosyl fiber. It unveils a porous structure within uh, where the, the moisture is being distributed. So on the surface, the fiber is round shaped. And uh, what you can see here in blue, this is the water, the water content ins inside of the fiber. But that does not mean that it is, is wet. Uh, in a combination with other fibers, it helps also to distribute uh, the, the moisture alongside of the fiber. If you see it, uh, if you see it, this picture over there, uh, this kidney bean uh, fiber is the cotton. It does not absorb as much moisture as the tensile fiber. And here on that side, this um, cross section is polyester. Um, most of the cases, uh, when it comes to performance apparel, we are seeing our fiber as blending partner with synthetic right. fibers. Okay. Which is what Ashwin was saying. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Carmen, has, ha have you, has HiQ looked into the performance properties of Aonic? What, what have you found? Yes, we did, of course, as we claim to substitute polyester and nylon. I think this is the most important part we have to cover in the future. Um, so first of all, we did the first trials on wovens, and we enhanced them with our bio-based um, eco trial finishing. It's a water repellent finishing. If it comes to outerwear and, and the outer layer, which is woven, um, the results are already very good. Um, finishings for us is a midterm solution. We use our own bio-based finishings, and um, we are looking for a permanent solution in the near future. Um, that means giving the fiber a certain performance during the spinning process. So do you think that blends, because Andreas seems to say that when you want to activate some of the functions, it's combining your lyocell with something else? Yeah, I mean, we, are, um, we have to uh, say that um, for sports lifestyle, you can use tensile for for yeah for fashion, so here the comfort is is um, dominating uh, the performance. It also because of the round shaped cross section, uh, the the colors become very saturated. Um, we see us also as blending partner with cotton, okay. and uh, of course with synthetics. Um, so there's another big issue in our industry, and that is the matter of price. Polyester is widely used in part because it is cheap and, I guess, scalable, as Ashwin said earlier. Um, do you believe that cellulosics can be cost competitive in our industry? Whoever wants to... When fully scale up, we are cost competitive, that's for sure. I think it's a matter of scaling up the feedstock and uh, design and process on the, on the, yeah, if you call it gigafactory, if you really provide the mass volume, then these are the factors that uh, dominate the price. Right. Because polyester is mass produced today. Yeah. Okay. And very cheap. And very cheap, yeah. Andreas and Ashwin? Um, we are producing in Lansing uh, since um, 80 years, uh, all three generations of man-made cellulosic fibers, starting with viscose. Then uh, 60 years later, we came up with a modified viscose, the modal uh, fiber, mm -hmm. which has a higher wet modulus and a better strength. And our latest generation is tensile, which is produced in a physical production process. So it's just uh, a solvent, which is non-toxic water, 
and pulp from wood, which goes into solution. And then the dope, the so-called dope, will be extruded through to the spinnerets, and then the fiber comes off. So uh, the properties of tensile are, the tensile name comes from tenacity cellulose, so it implies that it's the strongest cellulosic fiber. Mm. It has a round-shaped cross-section, uh, which uh, leads to um, a better bending stiffness, as I mentioned before. It is also antibacterial, because uh, of the smooth fiber surface, bacteria cannot cling. Mm -hmm. It is anti-static. So when it comes to blends with synthetic fiber, it discharges the electric energy. So most of the blends in the meantime are blends with uh, wool fibers. Wool has a, a the benefit that it is warm, tensile is cool. So for summer apparel, both fibers lead to a better uh, apparel. And it's also hygiene, so bacteria cannot grow grow on the, on the fiber surface, and all properties together are leading to um, superior natural fiber. Okay. I Ashwin. think there is uh, an edge for synthetic materials over cellulose uh, with regards to that mass production or with regards to the costing. Although we all agree that both synthetic and regenerated cellulose, even cotton or wool, don't have infinite resources. There are finite resources with regards to oil or with regards to the plantation. Uh, but uh, if you look at a broader spectrum, uh, only about 2% of the fossil fuels are used for textiles and apparel uses. So there is still a huge amount of uh, capacity, if needed, that can be utilized for mass production of synthetic fibers. Okay. Um, so let's uh, move on to the question of biodegradability. How important is biodegradability in active wear? Do you feel that this is a property that brands and consumers are looking for? I'll ask all three of you, and I will pull up a slide that Andreas has supplied. go back? Uh, yeah, thank you. So since our tensile lyocell fiber, but also our viscose fibers and modal branded uh, fibers are completely dissolvable, so they completely disintegrate um, after uh, 30 days, uh, uh, after 70 days uh, in the household compost. At our booth, uh, next to Weichert booth, we have uh, designed a jacket, uh, a wadded jacket, which is completely dissolvable. So it completely disintegrates in, uh, disintegrates in, the, in, the, in the ground. In compost? In compost, yeah. We did this in our R&D uh, department under controlled conditions. And uh, if you see uh, the, the, the process, um, you can see that it, 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 it completely disintegrates in the, in, in the, in the ground. But also under... Um, we did uh, a study at the Oceanic uh, Inst Institute of uh, San Diego, Scrip, the Scripps study, and also here we could prove that uh, tensile completely dissolves after 77 days in the water, in the seawater. Mm. Uh, I have also to say here in that context, uh, the latest uh, um, uh, edition from the uh, El MacArthur uh, Foundation says, if we do not stop to... Um, put microplastic into the oceans, then there will be, by the 2050, um, uh, as much as uh, micro microplastic in the oceans as, as marine life. It's fish, I know, yeah. So this is, yeah, it, it's, it's a topic which is really, um, yeah, mm. tremendous. It's 850 million, actually, microplastics and 812 million fish. So it's more microplastic than fish, and the fish will be completely contaminated. That's mm. the studies, yeah. Yes, Ashwin, and, and I guess uh, biodegradability is an important uh, part of what uh, we talk about at in the current days, and it's uh, that's where the synthetic has the biggest disadvantage. However, there are research done, there are technology advancement 
uh, on part of research on uh, synthetics where things are done to enhance the biodegradability of synthetics. So uh, yes. synthetics uh, in near term, we're not there yet, but we are close to being there with uh, more research to be done where synthetics can be disposed of or changed in a way where it won't have that big an impact on environment. Okay. Let's show the video if it would. You have a video? Yes, the biodegradation slide. I think it's very interesting to show. I didn't check if it was yeah, it's connected. Here. Yeah. It is. So I come down to, to show you what we did. This is a simple lab experiment everybody can do at home. Um, we put fabrics into a soil, into an aquarium, and we put water on top. And at the left, you see 100% polyester, and at the right, you see 100% cotton. Second from the right is 100% high key ionic. Third is ionic with 6% elastane. This is very interesting to show, because if you look at how it biodegrades within three months, the end is Ionic is completely gone. It's the second uh, from, the, from the right. Interesting is the third from the right is ionic with elastan. After two and a half months, you only see the elastan grid that is left. Ionic is completely gone. And if you look at three months, polyester is still there. It's mold and fungus, but nothing happens with the polyester. Ionic is completely gone. And then in the middle, you have still the elastan grid. Um, Polyester takes up to 1,000 years. We don't know if it's fully degraded after 1,000 years. And cotton is still there, but starts to degrade. Um, interesting here is to come back to your previous question, if we talk about performance. Performance is needed. Um, but if you look on this, and that's why we are here today, how much performance is needed. Is it really every single garment we produce that has this high performance we request? Or is it enough if I have a jacket and I walk the dog to have a water repellency? So I just asked the question in this round because I think we need to think further. And maybe we watch the video. It's, it's really short. Um, it's there. And I think it's very impressive to just look at it. Sorry, uh, I just I didn't heard the video isn't there, but I think I think it's it's very it's very valid. And if you want to watch it, it's also on our website. You can have a look. And as said, everybody can do this at home. There is no trick behind here. It is, it's ah yeah. It just is. just click, and then we can watch it on YouTube. Should work. Someone is doing that. Somebody okay, doing perfect. So I go. Super. Um, do you, I, I'm, I still am curious. Do you think this is a feature that the market needs, wants, and will pay for? I think first of all, we need to seek durability and recyclability. And um, we claim that Aeonic can be recycled eternally. Of course, on a several point, it will be gone as well. But then it needs to be 
biodegradable at the end of life cycle. So what we show here is the biodegradability at the end of life cycle. And uh, it's not a thing that happens in the, in the first round of using this material. Okay, okay. Andreas and Ashwin, do you want to? There are uh, multiple approaches. I mean, in Lansing, we are producing uh, our own energy. We are a biorefinery concept. That means our fibers are true carbon zero because uh, we do not need any uh, power from, uh, from fossil fuel. And therefore, we uh, name our fibers as carbon zero. And um, yeah, I mean, it's very important also to, to, ta to take this into account because the climate, also the air pollution is, is a tremendous uh, topic. And here we are contributing with our fibers uh, with uh, yeah, energy from biomass. Yeah, durability is also one of the important factor in uh, how we uh, project the use of apparels in future. The part about synthetic and the biggest advantage synthetic has is durability. If you look at uh, durability testing, synthetic lasts four to five times longer than cellulose. Like if you do an abrasion testing, Martindale, the time to ta uh, put a hole into a cotton or even a viscose or a uh, lyocell uh, fabric is probably around 15 to 20,000 martinel cycles versus the similar weight, apple to apple comparison, 100% polyester or 100% nylon fabric would not even put a dent after 80 to 100,000 cycles. So from the same perspective, a synthetic garment can be used longer. So that helps in the overall environmental impact of how synthetic has uh, on the climate. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, let's move on to recycling. We mentioned it a bit. And you know, man-made cellulose cellulosic fibers are being made today from used cotton. Um, but I've never heard of viscose or man-made cellulosic being recycled into a man-made cellulosic. So what's the situation there? Well, we have um, a new lyocell fiber, which we have invented some years ago. It's called Refibra. This fiber um, contains of uh, pulp from wood as well as pulp from cotton scraps. So we are working here with collectors which are supplying us with um, post-industrial waste and post-consumer waste. And we add 50% of this cotton pulp, this recycled cotton pulp, to our wood pulp. And this is the refibra concept. And here we are also contributing uh, with reducing landfill. Yeah. Carmen, so you say that Aionic will be recycled into Aionic. But that's yeah. a very new, I mean, it hasn't been done yet. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think we have three differentiation points to the um, well-known cellulosics that are on the market today. One is a feedstock. We are very flexible on feedstocks. So we started with using pre- and post-consumer waste now. Um, we work with Renew Cell Avenue and Zurich and are in a trial phase here. And then uh, we have a different process than the other cellulosics that are on the market so far. And we have different fiber KPIs. We are a filament fiber and um, it's very durable and it can be recycled. So what comes from nature goes to nature. It's the beauty of the concept that it's how we call it. And yes, it can be recycled. Okay. Um, Ashwin, I have a question for you about recycling because there's um, part of the drive to increase recycled content and specifically textile to textile recycling is to increase monomaterial design. How is dry release addressing this issue if your products are based on blends? So yes, monomaterial is the recent trend. However, it's very difficult to achieve that monomaterial garment. 
if it's a basic t-shirt, it might work very well. But if we're talking about a jacket, it has 10 to 100 different components. We're talking about buttons, zippers. So practically, it's not possible to have a monomaterial garment. Yeah, also, we, when we talk about mono material, it's primarily with the intent of recycling. Yes. But then if you look at recycling, the current in infrastructure is not in place to recycle. Even when we talk about, I'm talking US in particular, mm -hmm. we talk about a lot of packaging materials that are recyclable, but our recycling company at home don't even want to take all those recyclable materials for recycling because they don't have infrastructure yet. So if we're talking about packaging material that are huge in uh, sort of shape and sizes that cannot be recycled, I think we, we still, from a textile standpoint, still have to do a lot of work to be there where we can start recycling garments. Mm. That's possible. Um, Let's, let's open the questions to the audience um, on uh, cellulosics, synthetics, their blends, and, and their end-of-life solutions. Is Charles around? Oh, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for that. It was very interesting. But um, quite interested by the biodegradability results because you imply that cellulose biodegrades in a marine environment. But as Charles told us all yesterday, they found a waistcoat and a pair of jeans on the SS Central America, been on the bottom of the Atlantic for over 130 years. Those jeans were auctioned by Sotheby's for $114,000 or something. And there's a recent paper by a team in, East Af in Africa and Northumbria University sampling the waters off East Africa. Lots and lots of cellulose, both natural cotton and regenerated in those samples. Um, paper from a few years ago in the Mediterranean, seven times more cellulose in the Mediterranean sediments than there is polyester. This implies it isn't biodegrading in the real world, even if it does in labs where you hang it off a pier in, in North America or, or in a lab in these ideal conditions. And so it worries me that it doesn't biodegrade in reality, even though the tests imply it does. I just wondered what you thought. Anyone want to uh, react? I mean, of, of course, I, I fully agree with you. If, if the textiles have been finished or they have a, a, a durable water-resistant coating on top, um, they will not uh, disappear as much uh, or, or as good as under controlled conditions like 100% tensile as a, as a garment. But uh, we are also taking care. We are also giving solutions to the, m to the market. Uh, in order to use um, finishings or durable water-resistant uh, coatings with C0 chemistry. But uh, I fully agree. I mean, if you uh, coat a fabric with, with a C6 uh, chemistry and you cannot remove this, uh, it, it's different. Yeah, absolutely. And Andreas, yes. to pull you up, I think in 1860, they didn't have those finishes. This is when the ship sank. You know, so they didn't have synthetic colors. Mark, is that what you were gonna? Yeah, light and cold and all the rest of it. But did uh, they did they have synthetic dyes in those days? If you read the paper where they analyzed the waistcoat, they they found that the dyed sections of the waistcoat suffered zero percent cellulitic biodegradation, but the undyed sections suffered less than one percent biodegradation. Uh, in 130 odd years, so the dyed disc does kill the bacteria, but even the undyed sections were were not being dissolved, were not being degraded. Yeah. And I, I'm not trying to say cellulosic is terrible, or right? I just think it's really How, scary yeah. when people say, "Well, it biodegrades and polyester doesn't, or whatever." But um, in in reality, none of them do. I think. Yeah. Well, I think so too. I mean, I I've written a few papers uh, in World Sports Activewear on this. And it seems to me that there's a lot more cellulose on this planet than there are other polymers. Now, how does that af affect the presence of cellulosic Th that's fiber? An, it's an interesting point, that. And when they do these studies, they're claiming they're fibers. So 
there isn't. We we may. It could be wood fibers. The, 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 yeah, the, the way they analyze them and the, the length and flexibility and things is the sort of thing they include. So it could be, but I, I don't think it is when you look at I mean, the team on the African study included a forensic scientist and textile people. Um, so it, 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 I don't think it is. And we make twice as much polyester every year at the moment, have done for quite a long time now than we do cotton. So why is there so much cellulose in the ocean? It must have been accumulating over years. It's not. And th these are my concerns. I, I agree it could be from other sources too. But um, just a, I want to like to add that we have produced uh, now the second edition of a fabric book where we have incorporated fabrics uh, which are dyed with uh, non-harmful dye stuff uh, with a C0 coating with uh, backside calendar. So uh, with this fabric book, we are trying to give an, um, how to say, an idea to the industry to use uh, fabric producers which are doing clean products. You make some fantastic products. I'm, products. I'm not trying to demean them in any way. I just, just, just want people I to understand. I appreciate your, your, your input. Absolutely. It's true because in reality, there is a lot of work to do still in order to uh, keep the, the environment clean. For those of you who don't know Mark, by the way, Mark runs the testing lab at the School of Design, University of Leeds, which has general acknowledgement to be the best material testing lab of a public ownership. But second question. Sorry, thanks, Charles. Uh, first of all, awesome panels. I like the balanced uh, out. I've been working the past with basically all of your companies. Um, so, and I've done cradle to cradle t-shirt, which is usually, and, and a jacket, you unscrew the buttons and then it was all organic cotton. So, my point is that uh, the whole industry we should all uh, go by, as Nora say, you know, reduce, reuse, refuse, so buy less, buy more intentional. But uh, cradle to cradle book was published over 20 years ago, so in 2002, if I remember. So, how important, and then there's so much uh, talk about biodegradability for the textile industry, which, again, it, it's all awesome. but. How important is it? Because I do have a, you know, organic cottons or you know, natural basically stuff at home, but uh, I prefer synthetic when I'm you know, working out. So it seems that the industry now is getting obsessed since uh, usually the more constructed an item is, let's say outward and everything. So how important is it you know, from 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the biodegradability concept? Thanks. Anyone want to react to that? So biodegradability or try to somehow reuse it or convert it back into useful life is very important because we don't want to generate uh, piles and piles of waste that won't uh, be able to use and would have negative impact on the environment. So with the, the research that's going on, uh, either with regards to making synthetic biodegradable or if it's a mono uh, material, mono fiber garment or even with the blended uh, fabrics and garments, there are research being done. We're not there yet, but I think in the next 5, 10, 15 years, these would be addressed definitely where we can convert those materials into useful life or put it in a way where they will be biodegrading without impact to the environment. I got to leave. Yeah, I know that also, um, who is it? There's a lot of, uh, um, how to say, new research basically on bio-based and men's made fiber. So castor oil is coming up for nylons and, uh, and poly. It's, uh, it would be great, but then it depends always like uh, if we're using mono materials, if, if possibly one day there was going to be man's made fiber, bio-based uh, with organic and natural fiber, so and then, you know, we degrade the same or they need to be detangled. So that, that's, I know also in Seattle, there's Avenue, they're working a lot in that. Uh, in Customer question. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it's, so thank you for that. So, and uh, so for instance, a blended, uh, I've also worked with a company that were blending tensile organic cotton and uh, recycled polyester. Amazing uh, hand fill and everything, but uh, you know, 
where is the, how to say, the sustainability of that? So yes, you use a recycled poly, blended with natural and organic stuff. So how sustainable really is it? So how we define I'll sustainability? A question. How sustainable is what? Yes, how sustainable is that blend, for no, instance? not that blend. No. Name the blend. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, well, it's a company called Tantry. So it's, uh, the blend is a tree blend. So it's made of three components to one organic, one is tensile, and the other is rec poly. So how would you uh, define that product sustainable? First, can I ask you a question? So the, each fiber has a specific role to play in the blend? Yes, that's so, so roughly... So you've chosen it for a specific reason? Yes, there's, uh, I, if I remember correctly, it's 33 rec poly, and then uh, again, 33, 33, so yeah. Is this like the, I mean, if we go back a few years before we were into the monofiber and we need to recycle and we need to be biodegrade, we were also engineering high performance fabrics with a measure of elastane for stretch, a measure of this for that, and, you know, and we still need those products in the industry, right? Oh, yes, so it, it, there is still some part of sustainability in that product when we talk about using recycled polyester. So that, as I was telling before, uh, that polyester, which would have ended up in landfill, was reused and uh, made into a useful life in that 33% polyester, blended with cellulosic fiber. So uh, each fiber has its own role. Especially in when we talk about cellulose or regenerated cellulose or even cotton, it has its own advantage, but as a whole, it won't provide the properties that our industry, sportswear or activewear is looking at. Uh, take an example of hemp, regenerated cellulose again. You can, great fiber to work with, but you cannot make it as a 100% hemp fiber or 100% hemp yarn and fabric because of issues with regards to durability or spinability. So what we call is a concept called BFF. What we talk about, work-life balance. So I heard this concept at uh, some other seminar, which we talk about best fiber friend. So that combination of synthetic fibers along with those natural fibers, provide the optimum blend to get you the properties of what you're looking at, either wicking, fast drying, and a combination of it. And durability that comes And durability that. comes out. Hard compared to an organic uh, or recycled cotton, for instance. Yes. But it's, yeah, yes. What, uh, what, what would you measure from zero to 10? How sustainable is a blend made of, uh, again, a third of uh, uh, synthetic uh, fibers? coming from recycled, obviously, uh, water bottles and, uh, you know, two natural cellulose beds. So to sim answer you simply, it will be at least 33% sustainable because 33% <laughs> polyester. But then again, if you look at it from a perspective of cellulose, uh, cellulose being, again, sustainable, if it's uh, regenerated cellulose through uh, managed forestation and also uh, uh, closed loop Organic manufacturing cotton. process. We're talking about overall that product being 100% sustainable. It might not be sustainable compared to some other product, but it all depends on what the brand philosophy is, what they believe in. This, this reminds me, I had a question for you for the cellulosics. Where do you see your fibers bringing the most performance features? Is it like base layers, thermal layers, outerwear? Where do you where where are your properties best optimized? Uh, when we started to position tensile in the in the world of active wear, um, we um, have designed fabrics uh, close to skin. So because uh, tensile is a very has a very, very smooth uh, fiber surface, contributes to a better weld feeling on the, on the, on the skin. It is very smooth, it reduces odor, it's anti-static, so it has multiple it's a good properties. Solution. Yeah. And um, then uh, some years later, we moved into waddings, so non-wovens as, 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 as fiber fill. And now we ended up with uh, 
at the, at the very end, at, at uh, outer layers, where we have designed uh, a jacket which is made with 80% tensile, which is foldable. You can put it into the, the pocket. And um, in addition to this, um, we have we are not setting out that we can do everything with, with our fibers. We need some synthetic partners, for example. But in that particular case, we designed a jacket, which is very lightweight. It's a popelin and has 20% uh, bio-based nylon from castor beans. Okay. So this is, is a compromise, but um, we have a, a, a monomaterial jacket at our booth, which we have tested for the disintegration testing. Uh, this is 100% biodegradable and made with components like sewing thread from tensile, right. with uh, shell fabric from tensile, wadding 100% tensile, and even the, the YKK zippers, the, the, the material uh, the around the fabric, around the zippers uh, are made from tensile. Okay. So you, you can design it, but in reality, uh, it looks different. Okay. Carmen, have what, what, where do you see Ionic in sports? Where would it have the most impact or, or be the best Ionic use has been, for the audience here, Ionic has been launched in October 21, so we are the starter here. It's 15 months old, the project, and uh, we have started right from the beginning to develop the very first fabrics. Um, I have fabrics with me. Whoever wants to join me after the session can have a look on the fabrics. Um, we started to with next to skin garments as well. The first product has been launched, the first garment in January, with uh, our brand partner. And we have also launched the first fabrics for fashion. We have been on Milano Unica in February this year. Also, I have the fabrics with me. Um, it can be, let's say, the application is, is very wide as the, as the yarn is very versatile. So we have also the first wovens going into a direction outerwear, sportswear jackets. And uh, at the moment, we do not see any limitation. Okay. Charles, do we have, and the audience, do we have other questions? I want to wrap up with um, some virtual questions. Okay. Uh, four virtual questions. I might suggest you answer one each so that we finish on time vaguely. <laughs> so we have, do cellulosics fully degrade or are they transformed into smaller fragments which can't be seen by hu human eye which create other issues? That's the first question. Second one, were biodegradability, biodegradability studies performed on undyed or dyed samples? Does dyeing and finishing affect the performance slash time an ability to biodegrade. Third question, when they get there, how will the biodegradability of synthetics compare to cellulosics? In other words, the time frame. And the last question, uh, I've lost the place of the, um, which is more important, improving the biodegradability of synthetics or developing cellulosics to meet the standard of synthetics, if at all possible? So who wants to jump in with any of those answers? I can maybe answer on the uh, biodegradability on our experiment. Uh, the high Q-ionic fabric you have seen was a cradle-to-cradle -cradle dye, and we used our high Q-red because this is a, is a hard color to achieve, and it was a cradle-to-cradle -cradle dye. Um, coming back to what is happening when uh, our fibers are ending up in the ocean. Um, algae, for example, is also cellulosic part. So it, it's a natural material which completely disintegrates. I mean, we did not uh, hear any different uh, statements that uh, cellulose does co uh, pollute the, the ocean. So it's, it's cellulosic and like, like algae. We all know like that um, the fibers aren't the dangerous thing. It's they're used as carriers for the dodgy chemicals already in the ocean, of which three of the top five are agricultural wash off. DDT, pesticide and herbicide. No matter how good or bad your fibers are, if you intake DDT, pesticide or herbicide, you will not do good. Um, we are not using any pesticides. Uh, like no, no, you aren't using them. Okay. They are wash off from agriculture. Ah, okay. So got farmers it. are using them, they get washed off the land, they end up in the watercourse, they go to the ocean. That's our, to me, the biggest danger that we've got. 
The fibers are just the carriers that enable them to enter the food chain. Do people know this, by the way? They do know. <laughs> Carmen, does that? Well, we honor yeah. the last question. I really like it a lot, but it's a very philosophic question that, that ha uh, to me, uh, it has no answer. It's a, it's a thing we should all think about. And um, the question always if, is, if uh, polyester is biodegradable, what's left at the end in this biodegradation process? We don't know. We've yeah. got yeah. some ASTMs. ASTMs, it's got to be non-toxic, doesn't it? pass an ASTM. Yeah, and I can answer the third question. Yeah. Uh, so far, where we currently are with all the research, that polyester would biodegrade, takes longer than cellulose, but then it would still, majority of the components in the polyester, up to 85 to 90%, would biodegrade in an year, based on the a ASTM testing. It's, it's the test data, it hasn't put to, actual uh, use yet, but then if we're comparing the test data between cellulose and synthetics, uh, we have an apple-to-apple -apple comparison where we see biodegradation in a year. And uh, with regards to the question number four, uh, I lost my train of thought, so can you repeat that question, please? <laughs> Last question I asked was, what is more important, improving the biodegradability of synthetics or developing cellulosics to meet the standard of synthetics, if at all possible. Yes, I think uh, with, with, with mankind, restricting to one or the other doesn't make sense. I think both process needs to go parallel because synthetic has its own advantage, cellulose has its own advantage. So trying to find that middle ground with the blend of it or uh, research on a parallel path is more important than focusing on one or the other aspect. Yeah, I think there's a concept that we hear often in our industry is fit for purpose. So, and it, it's also pretty much the case here, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's all like, uh, w w when, when it comes to life, we uh, take an approach of uh, work-life balance or that that optimization, and I think that's the approach we need to take with regards to both synthetic and cellulose too. Okay, great, thank you so much. It's a great, very interesting topic. I'm gra glad we raised this question at performance days, and I'm there'll be more to come. I'm also glad there's not a clear-cut answer. It shows the amount of thought and development going on, and can I just say congratulations on it, and can I ask the audience to show their appreciation for all four of them, please. Thank you. Sophie, final words? That, yeah, I mean, that's, I, th I think it's, it's a question. It's a new question that's coming in this industry and that it's worthwhile taking time to think about it. Superb. We've overrun the time slot. It's all right. I'll let you off. Um, we're going to take a quick comfort break of about six minutes and then we'll be back with the next presentation. But thank you.